Okay, this is PJ for Axiom Curb. I'm outside the Nove Hotel in Sheffield. I'm attending the event held by Enor Crane, which is the Apific Hills. I'm hoping to get a short interview afterwards, so do stay tuned for that. Okay, I'm with uh, Enor Crane. Uh, we've just, I just attended the Apific Hills event with him, and uh, he's the former oil field executive. Yeah, is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like if you could answer these, I've got a few questions, a few other points as well. Uh, first I just want to talk about the Happy for Kills that you've just done today. Um, you've got five more to do, which is Brighton, Ipswich, Nottingham, Hull, York, and I think it ends in York at 1st of May. Yeah, next week. So we've got five through next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The events that you've done so far, how do you think they're turning out? As you expected or... More Absolutely more not. Days. I mean, obviously, in in some locations, we had really good turnout, like Glasgow and uh, Swansea, Manchester. Um, elsewhere, it's been you know relatively small numbers, but that's great yeah. because it means that we have you know more of an intimate event, if you like. Yeah. It's more interactive. Um, but I'm quite relaxed about relatively small numbers because if it was big numbers, then we might be drawing a little bit too much attention. So I'm quite happy that it's small numbers, you know, and as you saw tonight, there's a lot of good discussion, a lot of good debate, and that, I mean, you tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people will go away and talk to other people about what we've uh, been discussing tonight, Definitely. and in particular, the focus on getting people to seriously consider whether or not, by not voting, they're actually making the best choice, because as you know, a big part of what I'm trying to express in the Apathy Kills events, is by not engaging in the process, we are effectively doing exactly what the establishment want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm asking people to reconsider their decision not to vote um, and, and to participate in the process and use their vote wisely. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never voted, Ian, never voted. I have been, in the last year, open-minded to at least think about voting. Um, I think a lot of people don't vote with the fact that you know, after you get onto the electoral register, you can have the debt men hunting you down and things like that. And I think that's also an issue. I do, I do understand. I mean, yeah. and if people elect not to um, join the electoral roll, then it yeah. effectively means they can't vote anyway. Yeah. So I understand that. But if they are on the electoral roll, then by engaging in the process, they can actually make a difference. Yeah, which is more important than how much money you're in debt with. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and another thing, a lot of people are thinking that, they've begun to think that you can't change the system from within. What's your thoughts on that? There is no panacea. I mean, there's no quick fix. If there was, we'd have found it by now. And we should do whatever it is we need to do. So if we can change the system from within, we should try and do it. Yeah. But, you know, we shouldn't necessarily just rely on that. So we've got to also be building something outside of the system that can replace the system. But at the same time, if we ignored the opportunity to try and change the system from inside, we'd be missing a trick. Yeah, exactly. From both ends. Absolutely. Of Europe, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, from the Apathy Kills, you've also done the Voices from the Gas Fields, which is where you went, you went to Australia, you met with Brian Monk and many others. Um, I think you said to me 10 days, you'll be going on YouTube? Hopefully within, t within the next 10 days we'll be putting it out on open source. I mean I've still got two weeks, well yeah. sorry I've still got two weeks of editing costs to cover um, because we crowdfunded for four weeks but the actual project took six weeks right, okay. um, and I have no other means of support so I do need to raise that uh, money. Um, but then as soon as that's addressed then yeah we'll put it out on open source. Lovely. Concerns for over in Australia with the, the, the documentary you've done, Voices from the Gas Fields, what importance does that have for UK? Primarily, the unconventional gas industry is an insidious industry that leaves a trail of destruction wherever it goes in the world. The area of southern Queensland that I visited both in 2012 and um, more recently in 2014 um, is basically about the size of the UK. Queensland itself is seven times the size of the UK. I was focusing my um, research there, my time in the gas fields in an area about 250 miles or so to the west of Brisbane. And um, 
the population density of that area is a fraction of what it is here. And what I've really tried to convey in the documentary is the magnitude of the devastation in Queensland and the impact that it's had on the lives of the people there. When you consider that this country is a hundred times more densely populated than Queensland, the impact on communities in this country will be far greater than it is in Queensland. Which uh, also moves me on to your fracking nightmare. You've done 48 ep episodes over two and a half years? 50 now. Is it 50 now? 50, yeah. Okay. 50 uh, episodes of Fracking Nightmare. No, in a year and a half. Right, okay. In a year and a half? Yeah, yeah. The right. first one went out in um, November of uh, 2013. All right, okay. We must have a, a bit of research wrong here then. Uh, so, are all the contracts now tendered? The, no, there was the 14th round of licensing, right. um, which... Uh, tenders had to be submitted by October 28th of last year. There were 295 licenses up for grabs, which is, it was effectively 46% of the country. Um, we don't know exactly what licenses were bid for, but what we do know is that 95 of the 295 were tendered for. Right. So that means that potentially when those bids are adjudicated, we are looking at a situation where another... 15% of the country, in addition to the 18% that's already licensed, so that's 33%. So by the end of this year, we could literally be in a situation where one third of this entire country is licensed for the exploitation of unconventional gas. Mm -hmm. My next question is, um, which is, you've actually answered it in the event tonight on Apathy Kills. Um, for anybody else who's going to attend the last five you've got, I'll also pick up on this answer. But uh, the fracking, is it just about test drilling? Is it about actual fracking, or is it about pump and dump? I think a combination of all three. Yeah. Basically, um, I think the industry is looking to maximise as, as much as it can. Uh, so I think that what they're, they're trying to do, or what they wanted to do, or they didn't bank on the oil price tanking down to around 50 bucks a barrel. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, as I expressed tonight, this industry is not viable at, at these kind of pricing levels. And elsewhere in the world, the industry is being put into hibernation. So why is it that the British government is still uh, pushing ahead with this agenda? And why is it that the companies even are considering pushing ahead when there's no possible way they can make a profit when the price is um, 25 bucks a barrel below what it's going to cost to get out of the ground? So obviously one can argue that they're banking on the price of oil going back up. Which but is probably the Gatwick story. Which is the Gatwick story, but yeah. that, as we described tonight, that's yeah. a, a, you know, it, was, it was a con um, to get people, get mug punters to throw the money at David Lenegas. But I think more concerning is the potential that this industry considers itself a, um, a vehicle by which the government can establish the deep geological disposal repositories which are outlined in the white paper that the government published last July, July 2014. That white paper is titled Implementing Geological Disposal. And um, I would encourage people to search for it. You can uh, just search for Deep Geological Disposal White Paper 2014. And it's a 55-page document that outlines the British government's game plan to turn this country into a toxic nuclear waste dump. Would this have uh, any connection with the Trident if the Trident got shut down? I don't know directly. I mean, it's certainly something that uh, you know one has to uh, keep monitoring, yeah. but I don't know specifically. Uh, your humanity versus insanity. Thirty-eight episodes I've got here. Is that right? I think that's right. <laughs> okay. As more people are waking up and the and the powers that be attempt to contain that, do you feel? that the population of UK are yet to face even more draconian laws from the beast? Absolutely. Without a doubt? Without a doubt. I mean, I think, you know, we're seeing it in, in Spain where we've got the, uh, the gagging laws, there's a raft of gagging laws that have been implemented. And, uh, you know, Spain is a bit the experiment. If it works in Spain, they'll try and roll it out elsewhere. Um, it, we, do, we in the UK and elsewhere in the world, there are more and more people waking up and to the realisation of what's occurring and more and more people are getting involved which is why the establishment is accelerating its surveillance and control agenda which I discussed yeah. at some length this evening 
so you know, it's a bit of a two-edged sword for them because the more outrageous they get in terms of uh, shutting down uh, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, uh, right to uh, uh, peaceful protest, then you know, people go, hang on a second, there's something not right here. So it does backfire on them. So we're in, I think, a very, very interesting period in our evolutionary process. And then, of course, as I've been discussing tonight, you know, how we react over the next five years is going to be absolutely seminal. Mm -hmm. Crucial, yeah. Uh, apart from Spain, which you just said, France is uh, it's basically you're guilty until proven innocent. This is um, Napoleonic law. Um, yes, basically under um, uh, civil law. Yeah which is uh, Napoleonic law, you are effectively guilty of anything you are accused of until you have done whatever it takes to prove yourself innocent. Very different from common law, of course, where you are innocent until you are proven to be guilty. But um, the British establishment wants to embrace civil law, of course. And, and, and set that through the rest of the EU yep. at some point. Yeah. Uh, and, and bearing in mind that the southern part of England is on to France, is, is it on to France, a certain part of southern England? Um, where the European plan is to effectively destroy the nation states yeah. and to regionalise the EU, then yes, parts of uh, southern England effectively becomes part of France. I mean, you know, the, these are the outlandish visions of the globalists who want to destroy the nation state. And if people want to see um, the prima facie evidence that that is the intention, then just search for Peter Sutherland, who did an interview with the BBC on June 21st, 2012. And in that interview, he stated categorically that the, the agenda within Europe was to destroy national homogeneity. And the way in which they were going to do that was through immigration. So that's not a statement, you know. Which is interesting how your kids just come about with that main, you know, thing on immigration in its own could be enough for just your kid. Um, another question I, I want to bring, you, bring to you is the TTIP, the Transatlantic mm -hmm. Trade Investment Partnership. Uh, it's the free trade agreement between the EU and US. Uh, the question to you is, well, this is from somebody else, but it's to you is, will it be a, a corporation takeover and a loss of sovereignty and if so, what sovereign set will we have left? None. None at all? No. Basically, what is being prepared, the, um, it's the US and Europe is TTIP, yeah. as you say, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. The other side, US and Asia, is the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Basically, what it is, is the global corporations effectively establishing a raft of legislation that supersedes all national sovereignty. And the first element of this we've actually seen in Australia in the last um, uh, 24 hours, where the New South Wales government um, withdrew Matt Gasco's license to be able to drill at a place called Bentley. And it withdrew the license on the grounds that there was 2,000 people there on average, and some days, the weekends, there was more, protesting against the company starting to drill for uh, coal seam gas, coal bed methane as we call it. And they withdrew the license on the grounds that they clearly hadn't fulfilled their obligation to consult with the local community. Megasco took the New South Wales government to court and the judge has ruled that the um, government was wrong to prevent them from um, drilling and that the government should pay all their court costs. Mm -hmm. And what we are looking at is a situation where any time the government says, I'm sorry, but we're not going to permit you to do that, the corporations can come in and say, well, we're going to sue you. Yeah. And in law, they will, in, in the new law, they will effectively be guaranteed a win. Uh, so the, uh, is it the TTP that's a South American? That's uh, the US and, well, it's the Pacific. It's just the Pacific. So it's the Pacific Rim countries with the US. Right, OK. And uh, also with the TTIP, we've got, can, uh, four candidates here you know, over the past week have um, done a few comments. We've got Labour candidate Mike Grapes. He said it's the biggest prize in global trade. Uh, Green Party candidate Hugh Small. He admitted he was not against the TTIP. 
Uh, Lib Dem candidate Anuja Prasha, I think it is, potentially says it has the potential to give too much power to multinational companies. Absolutely. And UKIP Robert Stevenson, he said his party would not sign up to TTIP. What's your thoughts on, on them? Um, my observation for the Green Party is that they clearly haven't done the research. Right. Um, with, uh, with UKIP, I mean, obviously, to, um, to block it is in line with you know, their, yeah. uh, their policy. I mean, you know, I think we've got to get some balance between the political parties here. Because you know, UKIP is almost about total isolationism for the UK, and um, you know, one of the issues, perhaps, with the Green Party is that they're for you know all embracing um, the global agenda. I mean, in Australia, just two years ago, the Green Party website stated categorically that they were in favour of the One World Government. Um, yeah, I would argue that obviously in the absolute ideal scenario we would have a one world government but we're light years away from it we're absolutely light years away and it wouldn't be benign you know actually TTIP and um, the TTP are an attempt to establish global governance by the corporations yeah. and, and that does not have humanity's best interests at heart so I would urge MPs or prospective parliamentary candidates to do a bit more research and understand that um, you know, this would destroy the power of the British government to effectively rule against the corporations. Would you say it's treason if it did go through? <sighs> it's a tricky one. I know. It's a tricky one, but I mean, obviously, if we define treason as effectively handing power over to a foreign entity, then treason was committed in 1974 when we signed up to the EC in the first place. Yeah, true. That's, uh, that's my thoughts as well, Ian, I share that with you. Uh, one more thing, a direct democracy. Is it something you'd entertain, or would you uh, rather tackle it in a, in a different way? I, I think the, the problem that we have is that the establishment likes democracy in its current form because it's the easiest system to manipulate. I think we have not yet developed the form of community government that we need to build upon um, to actually get this country back on track. I mean, I think we've got to start building from the ground up. The, the problem that we've got is that the corporations effectively control our politicians. So the politicians either play ball, in other words, they succumb to all the corporate pressures, or they're removed. And that's why they like this form of government, because if they don't get what they want, they can change the whole thing in five years. I think we've got to find something that's a little bit more resilient in terms of um, challenging the, the corporatist agenda. And, and right now, I would say I don't have that in terms of a blueprint. But I think what we've got to do is start getting people to engage at community level and then as people start to build networks across community, I think we're going to see a new paradigm evolve. Yeah. Which is what Thatcher's era totally destroyed. Absolutely. Um, Beppe Grillo, I think his name is, he's the one in Italy. He set up something similar to direct democracy. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think he did? Listen, I mean, Italy's an interesting job. case. I mean, we've also got direct democracy, of course, in uh, a direct democracy party in Ireland. And, listen, I mean, when you want to change the existing paradigm, sometimes you've got to take a punt with something. And um, Italy's got a, an appalling record post-Second World War. I mean, I don't know how many governments it's up to now. Probably 40-something. But, I mean, it, it may be even more. Because of their form of um, um, the proportional representation. Uh, that's a blatant corruption. And, and the corruption, <laughs> exactly. But they never ever get a majority, no. a clear majority. So again, it's an easy system to manipulate. So, you know, hey, if something's new, give it a whirl. Okay, Let's so not knock it until it's actually had a chance. So, uh, a message to the people for the rest of 2015. Engage in the process. You know, our form of government, our form of democracy, absolutely relies on people not participating. And we've got to change that. Um, you know, when people say we can't make a difference, we can. Um, but if you're not prepared to engage, you're not going to make a difference. So, like I said, there's no panacea. 
you know, just engaging in their system to bring about change isn't the total answer. We've also got to build something to replace it. Yeah. But, you know, let's not leave any stone unturned. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, I think that's all my questions that I had, really. Okay. I could have gone for the rest of the night, but I kept it as brief as I could. And to the point for what you're doing uh, with the work, which is excellent, tremendous work, you're out there. I don't know where you get your energy from, as I said to you earlier. But it's just inspiring me watching you running up a dark country, attending different events in different places, and I just can't work out how you get there. <laughs> with the, the, it seems to be on YouTube with the videos you put up, and I just can't work it out. But you do, you're doing excellent. Uh, other than that, is there anything else you'd like to mention? No, thanks for coming along tonight. It's good to hook up with you. We've been communicating through um, well, well over a year now. Facebook well over a year, and uh, it's thanks to you that I got the. Uh, humanity vs Insanity and Fracking Nightmare playlists up on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I and just lower up that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, look, it's a team effort. Yeah. You know, I am at a particular stage in my life where I have the luxury to be able to be mobile, mm -hmm. um, to chase up and down the country. Obviously, not everybody can do that. Not and especially on trains. No, especially not on trains. <laughs> and all we can ask is that you, know, that people participate in whatever way they can. You know, some have more time than others. Obviously, people have got to take care of their own family responsibilities. That's got to be a priority. But if you can create a bit of spare time to get involved in some way, shape, or form, you know, the next generation need us to do whatever we can. So you don't promote or encourage people to do protest and eclectivism or anything like that as, as far as petitions go? No, I, I mean, I hate petitions with a vengeance because yeah. I, I think petitions are um, uh, disempowering um, because people think, oh, that's it, I've clicked on the petition, I've done my bit. No one gives a damn. And, and it's the same with even a, a hard copy petition. Mm. You sign a petition, say, that's it, I've done my bit. No one cares. You know, go to Downing Street. Every 15 minutes you'll see someone come along with a petition and then they can report back to their community and say, oh, we've handed in a petition to um, 10 Downing Street. No one cares. No one's going to read it. It's going to be binned as soon as it, you know, the front door's closed. The same with one-day protests. You know, they're a social safety valve. You know, everybody has a nice time. It's good for networking. But, but in the home. scheme of things, nothing home. changes. Yeah. You know, that's why you know, the anti-fracking community has followed the lead that probably was kicked off by Occupy, which is that if you're going to make a difference, be serious about it. You know, let it be known that you ain't going anywhere until that industry or whatever it is you're trying to shut down is shut down and gone. What about the, uh, the people who'd love to do this, but they're, they're either vulnerable or they're in some sort of fear? No, look, I mean, don't step out. You know, obviously, we all step out of our comfort zone a little bit. A little bit. Um, for sure. Some I mean, more than others. Some more than others. You know, as, as David Monk says in the Voices from the Gasfields film, You've got to go deep within yourself. Find something within yourself that you know gives you that power to be able to confront you know whatever it is that you're confronting. Mm. It's stepping out of your comfort zone for sure, and it's like all things: the more you do it, the easier it gets. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's better that people take the time to think about how they want to get involved, in what way, shape, or form, and then commit to it. It's an individual thing, it has to be Absolutely. done on their, on their there's, there's no right or wrong here, it's whatever people feel they can do. And if they think of something that he's doing, then go do it. You know, um, what we've got to stop doing is, and I, I don't get it anymore because people know how I respond. But a few years ago, I used to get you know, emails or phone calls saying, Hey Ian, have you thought of this, or have you thought of that, or have you done this? I don't want to hear that. What I want to hear is people say, Ian, I'm, I'm I've this. done this, or I'm doing this, and you know... And that's great, because that's, that's when you're learning that people are empowering themselves, and I always encourage them, you know, nothing is ever a bad idea. If somebody sent an idea, I'll encourage them. Give it a whirl. Brilliant stuff. Last uh, point I want to make is the, uh, I mentioned it to you during your event, it's the uh, Criminal Justice and Courts Act, Section 26, and uh, the other bit where they've basically made anybody, whether you're guilty or not guilty, pay court costs. Yes. Is this anything to do with the general election coming up soon, do you think? Oh, of course. Um, and you know, the other thing that it's doing is, I mean, David Cameron has stated categorically that if he gets back into power, he wants to repeal the um, Human Rights Act. Yeah. And, and right now, you know, it's the Human Rights Act, particularly Articles 10 and 11, the fundamental right to assembly and the fundamental right to peaceful protest, 
that is enabling us to do what we've done, you know, in terms of trying to shut down the um, anti uh, or the unconventional gas industry. Um, and the right-wing press always precede any observation about the Human Rights Act by calling it the hated Human Rights Act. The only people who hate the Human Rights Act are the government and the corporations. Which is what the EU is like, people like Abu Wamza and Qatar for. Exactly. Right, yeah, I understand that. Exactly. So for, yeah, so for the general election that's coming up, David Cameron, we just said then, he also said that if he didn't stick to his promises, boot him out, and that was five years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about not doing the next term, a third term, were he? Yeah. Um, but he's not ruled out the next term. Yeah. Even though all his promises he broke. Pretty much. Uh, so, how people aren't going to kick him out, I'm not, I'm not too sure on how that's going to materialise, which is what it's all about, I suppose. Um, but other than that, that's, I think that's my questions, Ian. Thank, you, thank you very much for your time, and uh, hope you keep doing what you're doing. And uh, Is there any more events in the future that you've got planned? Or is it well, we've got AB6 coming up and, um, in uh, Daventry in uh, the middle of May. Yeah. Um, and then, basically, I want to see what happens at the election, and... Um, then you know, yeah, decide yeah. where I go yeah. from uh, from there. That'd be wise. Yeah, good thinking. Right. Yeah, that's okay. Grand. Thanks All very right. much indeed. Very much. Thanks a lot.